Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. So in the last video, we used our template and we added in some contract data and then we queried that contract. We got back some values and we manipulated those values with some functions with Web3 functionality. What we're gonna do in this one is look at a couple more things around that first and then we are going to grab some data from some wallets. So first off, I wanted to take note that within the documentation, there's actually a working with ERC-20 token contract section. If you wanted to play around a little more as some homework, cruise through here, see what's in there, play around with some of the stuff. It'll be beneficial to put in some more reps. Also, I wanted you to note that within the ethereum.org, you can also look at other things. So first thing to note is we looked at the ERC-20 right? And this is a fungible token, non-fungible NFT. Fungible means that everything is the same, right? Every single token is exactly the same. If you have, you know, one link token, it's the same as the other link token, but with the NFT non-fungible tokens, everyone is different. So like the different playing cards you put on the blockchain or the JPEGs and pictures and, you know, ownership to a house, etc. These are non-fungible, meaning every single one's different but you can also query these as well. So if you look on the blockchain at uh, NFTs, you can query the methods in that as well and see the balance of that, the owner of it, etc. So I also say go online, find some NFTs and try some of this functionality with your template and pull back some data. You know, learn about these other standards and it'll really help you and it'll be beneficial. So now let's take a look at wallets. How do we pull back the balance and how do we use it for other purposes? So we have web3.eth.getbalance. Again, this is right within the documentation. We just pass it an address and we can get back a balance. So let's do that. So what we're going to do is we have a new wallets.py here and we're going to grab everything up to the address. We don't actually need to create a instance of this contract to interact with, we just need to pass a address to web three. So we're gonna do that and we're gonna paste this in here and we need an address. So what address are we gonna use? Well, we can hop right on Etherscan or you feel free to use one of your own addresses and pull the balance back on that if you want. But I'm going to refresh this and we're gonna scroll down and we're just gonna grab an address. So this says we have 2.6 or 2.16 balance in here, okay, perfect. And we copied this and let's pop this in here and see if we can get that balance back. So we have that. And remember, we are also using this to check some address to make sure we have the proper format. So we can say web3 dot eth dot get balance. And then we're just gonna put in our target address and what that's gonna do, again, it's gonna pull back the amount of way in the contract, which is gonna be much larger than that 2.16 ether. It's actually gonna have like 18 zeros after it. So we wanna format this into ether so that way we can verify it's the same as what we just saw quite easily. So let's wrap this in a print function. First off, so we can print it out. And then in there, let's convert it to way or from way into ether like we did in the last video with a web three dot from way and we'll wrap that in parentheses here and once we do that we will say we want ether right so that should bring back the ether from the contract which was that 2.16 ether so if we do that now we say python 03 and i run that we're gonna get back the 2.16 ether, perfect. Exactly what we saw and that's how we grab the balance. Now, this could have been a contract we got the balance from, it could have been a wallet we got the balance from. How do we know the difference and why is that significant? Well, you'll notice, so when we did some forensics in some of my older videos and we were monitoring some hackers, we didn't know you know, right off the bat, you know, is the address where he's scamming everybody, is that going to a contract where it gets processed and things happen? Or is it just going to a personal wallet for storage and usage later? Well, we can determine that with something called get code, right? So if we look on documentation here, I can search 
get code. And that'll pull back this method here. And it's going to be, also notice the depreciated thing. So they've been switching everything from the um, case with, I believe it was that camel case to the underscore versions of it. So for being future proof, use the underscore versions that are not depreciated. Another tip there, but you can say web3.getCode with the address and it will return the byte code if it's a contract. However, if it's a private address, it's just gonna return 0.x. So that's a way for you to determine whether something is a contract or whether something's a wallet and then make a decision based on that. So let's give that a try. So what we just looked at, I believe was a wallet. We can probably double check that by actually looking at it here. Let's see. Um, yeah, I don't see anything with contract in here. So this is a wallet. So if we run on here, we should get back 0x or yeah. So we'll say print web get code, or actually we're gonna do got get code cause that's a new one. And we'll say we wanna do that to our target address. And once we do that, it should pull back the byte code if it's a contract, but if it's, since it's not, it should just pull back zero X. So in this case, it pulled back B for byte code and it's just empty. So same difference, it pulled back nothing saying that there was no byte code associated with this address. Now, if we have a contract and we deploy this contract to the blockchain, we have the code on there, but we also have the byte code. So if we take a look at our chain link again, let's look for that. I'm going to grab the contract address again, but we're also gonna take a look at the contract. And within the contract, we have all of our you know, code in here, but we also have the byte code. And this byte code was created for this contract when the contract was deployed. And this byte code, if we were to decompile it, should give us a form of this code similar to that. Although it'll be slightly different when you decompile because decompiling just gives you a representative example that will work, not necessarily the exact way that it was originally created, which is why decompiling code and looking at it is never gonna be perfect, but it gives you the representation. So if you want, try to decompile that and take a look at it. What we're gonna do is we're going to pull back that byte code first off, right from here by grabbing here, and we are going to put it in here. Instead of doing target address, we're going to switch this out here, and then we should be able to just run this and it will grab all the byte code from the contract. And here's all the byte code from the contract. Now we could grab this bytecode and we could also decompile it with various things. Um, there's some, you know, on the command line decompilers, there's also some tools online. And when you decompile it, it will give you the code or you can disassemble it and get the assembly version of the code and kind of look at that and understand that. That's something that we're probably going to do at the end of this course when we get a little more into some deep in the weed stuff. Right now, just understand that, you know, you can tell the difference between a target address and whether it's a contract or whether it's a wallet by taking a look at the bytecode that comes back. Does it bring bytecode back or does it not? Now you can make decisions based on that. And if you really want to, and we could try it really quick, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You can actually do a decompilation of the bytecode right on here. Sometimes it doesn't work, other times it does. Decompiler is experimental, unexpected error occurred, right? So we didn't actually get it this time. I've had it work, I've had it not work. Um, it uses a Paranox decompiler. We could also, you know, search online for a decompiler and then dump this in here and try it out there or search for a EVM disassembler and dump it in there and try to get the ASM. We'll do that later, like I said, but I'm just showing you all the things around what we're doing. So you get a deeper understanding of everything we're doing in Python, as well as everything we're interacting with and how things function, not just how to do ABC, because ABC locks you into a mindset where all you can do is ABC, but if you start exploring everything around that, then your mind starts going places where you can start coding interactive and fun things and not just be stuck in 
I can only do you know exactly what's in the documentation or exactly in the course that the material I learned. I want you to play around with all of these things as you're learning it. So hopefully you learned something in this video. In the next one, we are actually going to sign some transactions before we get into interacting with real smart contracts and doing things. Because we need to understand how to sign transactions first so we can actually deal with sending value and making changes. So I'll catch you in the next video. Hopefully this was useful. Please like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter. I greatly appreciate it.